annual meet when there there's one r- issue Oh No, but that's how it it's like that's how it's like connected to me now you have to Okay That's the point That's the point group of uh, troublemakers <laughs> here, here, here every year. Sorry, you were here last year, weren't you? Yeah. 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 I always come on this one. But we don't have a theme, do we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if that's going to be the slide. Every year. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
There's nobody to do it. It's me, and I'm not going to be here either. Pull me into that. So, if I need to turn the fans on, I don't know. Don't do anything. Just don't do anything. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Campbell. I'm the uh, vice chair of the budget committee, and I'm joined by councillors and uh, speaker uh, Francis Nunziata, councillor Mahavik, and, who are on the committee, and councillor Michael Ford, who has decided to join us. And in the audience, we have Mayor John Tory. Thank you for coming out to Etobicoke, Mr. Mayor. So we have quorum. Uh, I'd like to call the budget subcommittee uh, for Etobicoke East York and York consultations meeting to order. This meeting is one of a series of meetings that are happening across the city to hear public deputations on the 2018 capital and operating budgets. Uh, as usual, I'd like to remind everyone that these sessions are being taped. Uh, are there any declarations of uh, possible conflict of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Okay, seeing none. All right, so we'll start with the first deputation. Deputants have five minutes. And we'll give you a little bit of leeway. I'll give you a little bit of a heads up when you're approaching uh, the five minute mark. And uh, we'll start with uh, Miss Leah Houston. Hi, good afternoon. <coughs> and then after you've had your, your say, well, you can entertain questions uh, if, if there are any, okay? Sure, okay, great. Uh, Councillors Campbell, Ford, Mahavik, and Nunziata. My name's Leah Houston and I am the Artistic Director of Maybell Arts. Thank you so much for this opportunity to let you know about the incredible impact Toronto Arts Council funding is having in two of Etobicoke's most high needs neighborhoods. The first, Maybell, is a high density Toronto housing complex homes to, homes to thousands of low income newcomers to Canada. For the past 10 years, Maybell Arts has been working with thousands of residents of the Maybell neighborhood, located in Justin Duchano's Ward 5, to transform a public space in the center of the complex from a ne neglected thoroughfare into a vibrant park and heart of that community. The Toronto Arts Council has been with us in that endeavor from the very beginning. 
Over the past 10 years, the Toronto Arts Council has helped Maybell Arts bring dozens of professional artists, often at the top of their chosen discipline, to the Maybell community to create with people of all ages. Participants let us know that this creative exchange has increased their sense of personal well-being and their connection to their neighbors in a time of rapidly accelerating social isolation. Every day, Maybell youth show us the profound impact the, TCA, the TAC is having. Many Maybell youth have been participating in Maybell projects since they were four or five years old. Now, 14 and 15, these young people continue to work and play at Maybell Arts, thanks to our TAC-supported youth program. Many of these at-risk youth have their first employment experience at Maybell Arts. They assist with workshops and they provide translation and childcare because they know firsthand the impact Maybell Arts has had in their own lives and they want to share that impact. Youth receive college and university prep support and connect to local leaders through our mentorship program, all funded by the Toronto Arts Council and it's making a huge difference. Two years ago, Toronto Police Services invited Maybell Arts to begin a new project in Etobicoke's West Mall neighborhood. The first year of our project coalesced uh, with the Syrian crisis. Many Syrians were settling in and around the West Mall, this neighborhood, and we knew Maybell Arts needed to be involved. The Toronto Arts Council's newly developed Art in the Parks program offered us an incredible opportunity to reach out to these new Torontonians by funding programming that effectively engaged over 600 Syrian individuals and families. Uh, and all of this happened at Broadacres Park this, sum this summer and last, which I would encourage you to go visit. It's just up the road on the West Mall. Uh, the Toronto Arts Council's newly developed Art in the Parts program provided an incredible opportunity. And, the summer, and that summer and this summer, Maybell Youth Artists and staff partnered with the City of Toronto to bring new programming to over 300 asylum seekers being housed in Etobicoke overflow shelters, actually in Councillor Ward's ward, in Councillor Ford's ward. Um, and this was a really unique opportunity, partnering with the City of Toronto, who is housing these asylum seekers, to bring artists where they were being housed, uh, in a place where they actually had no access to programming. Uh, and then through the summer, actually busing them to this neighborhood, to the Broadacres Park, to enjoy more arts programming, again, funded by the Toronto Arts Council. Um, and so as your first uh, speaker, I am very pleased to represent the work that we're doing in, in Maybell, in the West Mall, in Etobicoke. We're proud to be part of the Etobicoke community. Uh, and we hope that you will continue to support the incredible work that arts are doing in, in Etobicoke and that you can understand that the arts, you know, it's not just about creativity, it's not just about expression, those, those things are very important. It's also about social cohesion and people coming together and getting to know one another. And that's a process I've been really proud to be a part of. So thanks so much. Well, no questions, thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Saeed Diri. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Campbell and Nanziara, uh, Councillor Mehevik and uh, Councillor Ford and uh, Mayor John Torrey. My name is Saeed Diri. I work with the Children's Aid Society of Toronto. First, I was a child protection worker and now I'm a community worker for uh, 20 years now with the Children's Aid Society of Toronto. Uh, the key message, too many families are unable to meet their basic needs in our city. We need a 2018 budget that makes real progress towards ending child and family poverty in Toronto. The key points here, the level of poverty among Toronto children and families is disturbingly high. Toronto has the highest rate of child and family poverty among its large Canadian cities, 26.3% of children are living in low-income families. Child poverty levels are over 50% in some city neighborhoods, example, Thorncliffe Park, Oakcrest, and Richem Park. 83% of indigenous families in the city of Toronto are living in poverty. Children in, fam ch in families who identify as visible minority are twice as likely to living in poverty in Toronto region compared to non-visible minority children. 40% of children in female-led single-parent families 
are living in poverty. The impact of poverty is exacerbated by long wait lists for basic services and supports. 100,000 families are on the wait list for subsidized housing. 62,000 residents are on wait list for recreation program spaces. 12,000 children are wait listed for subsidized childcare. The experience of poverty poses a barrier to the health development, well-being, and success of children and youth. Low-income children in Toronto are more likely to lack physical, emotional, social, cognitive, and communication skills when entering kindergarten, less likely to be participating in early learning or extracurricular activities, less likely to meet provincial math, reading, and writing standards in grade three. Poverty causes all. According to one recent estimate, poverty in Toronto alone costs government and citizens four to five billion dollars a year in healthy care and justice system costs as well as lost tax revenues. <clears throat> Children's Aid Society of Toronto workers visit families in their homes every day and see how poverty and poor housing conditions are negatively impacting children and their families. <clears throat> Children's Aid Society workers provide support to over 14,000 families a year. Our workers see firsthand the impact of poverty in our city, particularly how it disproportionately impacts racialized communities. Consider briefly the case of one family a worker visited recently to assist. This family with six children was living in a two and a half bedroom apartment. Four boys were sharing one bedroom with beds on top of each other and the two girls shared the other room. The parents have a queen bed in the half room den. There was no space for the children to read and no privacy from each other. The overcrowdedness was one reason for the children quarreling and a high level of stress. The rent of the apartment was $1,750, more than 45% of the family's gross income. After the children's aid worker saw that the family were struggling to meet the children's basic needs, he contacted uh, me, a community worker, who helped the family apply for affordable housing, and after some advocacy and a brief stay in a shelter, the family finally secured an affordable housing that enabled them to meet their children's basic needs. The family reported that their children's education level has improved because they have a space where they can do their homework and also can afford to pay a university student to tutor. This example illustrates the huge family benefit of being able to access affordable housing. Unfortunately, there are 100,000 families on the wait list for affordable housing, often waiting years to access housing, and the city's 2018 budget fails to include a plan to eliminate or even reduce the length of that wait list. City Council has committed to take action to reduce poverty and inequality by unanimously adopting the poverty reduction strategy in 2015. Council has also approved plans to improve access to affordable housing, transit, and child care. We urge you to fully implement recommendations from these plans in the 2018 budget by funding key actions including 1,400 new, new affordable housing units, plus 1,000 new shelter beds to provide emergency relief in short term. So can you uh, wrap up, please? Yeah, I'll give a copy, to, if, if that's okay, to the mayor and, and, and to the vice chair. Thank okay, you very okay, much. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay. No questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I give a copy to the mayor. Sure. Okay. okay. Next I have up Paulina O'Keefe. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillors Nanziata, Campbell, Mihovic, Ford, and the mayor. Uh, my name is Paulina O'Keefe Anthony. Um, I am an artist, an arts worker, a mother of two, and a very proud resident of Ward 6, South Etobicoke, in uh, Councillor Grimes's ward. Today I've come on behalf of Lakeshore Arts to thank you for the work that has been done to increase funding and resources into community arts, not only in our ward, but across the city. This increased investment has been critical in our bringing communities together. I'm sure many of you here are familiar with the Nordic City Report and its many positive statistics that have come out in regards to the, to, um, the arts in the city. 
Please allow me to animate some of those stats today and paint for you a real picture of the impact and the increase in arts funding to artists and arts organizations like Lakeshore Arts has had on our community, particularly in Ward 6. The report found that community arts participation was up by 34% to 400,000 in total, and the number of public arts activities was up 6.1% a year, and attendance was up 5.5% a year. In real life, this increase looks like parents like myself, who in a city where many costs are rising for childcare, family outings, and extracurricular activities, free public art activities gives me options to engage my children in being creative, stimulating their imaginations and development, and learning about the community around them. It helps them make local friends. It gives them an opportunity to leave legacy in this neighborhood. For example, uh, both mine and my daughter's poetry was on display as part of the My City, My Six, which was a great initiative, thank you. Uh, which we participated in through Lakeshore Arts. It shows them the value of art and how it brings people together, particularly when it engages their grandparents or their other family members who can become involved. It gets them outside exploring, interacting with people and not stuck in front of a screen. It shows them that their community is valuable. For me as a mother, it helps me out financially. For me as a mother, it is a mental health aid and respite. In the time that this report was being created between 2012 and 2016, I've already suffered two bouts of postpartum depression after both of my children. Community arts was what helped me through by giving me a break as my first child was able to be preoccupied with activities while living with only 55% of my income on mat leave. It helped me feel less isolated and alone and as I was able to interact with other adults, which is critical when you're home alone with two kids all day. It reminded me that I'm a part of this community and allows me to leave my legacy, reminds me that the work I do as an arts worker in the city is important and valued in this community in particular. Public art activities are not just one-off fun opportunities. Public arts supplements education, mental health supports, and community social building, which um, supports the city. The report also states that lassos have been instrumental in improving cultural spaces, expanding into more spaces over the course of the four years. This correlates to the 21% increase reported in earned revenue from 2012 to 2016. In real life, that translates to more funds going to artists like myself who have been hired through many amazing organizations like Lakeshore Arts to be able to practice art and engage in arts education in my own community. This means my kids and my students see that arts is a viable career. This means that I spend more time in community shopping locally, stimulating the local economy with money I was able to make locally. This means I don't have to scramble as a working mother to rush and pick up my kids from childcare across the city because they are down the street or usually able to partake in the activity that I'm teaching. This means I get to leave legacy in a place I was born and grew up in. This means I get to have lunch with my daughter sometimes because I'm teaching grade eights as part of Lakeshore's uh, Shazam art, um, in focus program in her school and she's super proud of that and that is important to me as a mother and a resident. This means that parents will encourage their kids to find value in expressing themselves through the arts, drastically reducing feelings of isolation and supporting mental health needs which I've seen firsthand in my last 13 years as an arts worker. This means that I'm not someone, uh, some one-off figure that floats into their neighborhood once. If I really inspire a student, they can reach me. They see me walking down the streets or frequenting the same no-frills um, as they are. Reach out for, for follow-up and support if needed. I can be right there to re-engage them or encourage them to continue pursuing an artistic skill they only may have realized they have in one of my workshops. All of these things to me are the huge impacts that have seen, I've seen in my community because of the increased investment in community arts funding, not to mention the beautification of our community through the many murals, painted mailboxes, public performances, which animate our parks and bring our community together. So thank you very much. That's great, thank you very much. Any questions? No, thank you. Thanks for your time. Next I have up uh, Manon Dwarka. I'm not Menon, I'm Carl Sprogas, co-chair of uh, Arts Etobicoke, and I'm just gonna speak very quickly here. Uh, Arts Etobicoke is entering its 45th year of serving the uh, people of Etobicoke, as well as extending the reach into other parts of Toronto. In that time, we've had uh, two executive directors, uh, Christine McIver and Louise Garfield. We are now coming into another era of our existence and serving the people of Etobicoke, as well as Toronto. And it's my pleasure to introduce our new executive director, Menon Dwarka, and he will present uh, Arts Etobicoke's presentation to you. You've heard me often enough, it's time to hear a new voice. Okay, thanks, Carl. 
Good afternoon. As Carl said, I'm Menin Dworka. In addition to being an Etobicoke resident, I'm also the executive director of Arts Etobicoke. Before I begin, I'd like to thank, uh, take a moment to thank the City Council for your continued support in our efforts to provide all Etobicoke residents, aficionados, and art makers alike with a richer quality of life through the arts. Many of you are familiar with our programs, most of which are oversubscribed this year uh, due to their popularity. Our adult art classes and after-school drop-in programs serve a wide spectrum of participants drawing from the, our neighborhood's uh, socioeconomic and cultural diversity. We are, in addition, increasing our services to the community. We've reinstituted our juried art show in our gallery space, which saw over 600 visitors in the last fiscal year. The show will be adjudicated by a prominent Canadian gallery, uh, um, which was represented at the Toronto International Art Show, as well as members of local GTH uh, A government art services. Our art rental program raised $49,000 from local businesses and individuals that we re redistribute to our member artists, allowing them to more fully participate in our local economy. Our QMAP program, which provides one of the few safe spaces for LGBT youth in no uh, North Etobicoke, is also funded by, um, supported by your funds. As you know, uh, the Nerdicity Report, uh, evaluating the impact of increases to City of Toronto cultural uh, grants from 2012-2016, uh, was adopted by the Economic Development and Culture Department at their last meeting of 2017. And many of their observations have been a key part of Arts Etobicoke's mandate. We expand the impact of grants beyond the city core. We help emerging artists receive some of their first support outside of their studies. And our space acts as a local hub for community interaction. We have also increased our efforts to collaborate with other organizations across the city, pursuing programming opportunities with the Canadian Opera Company, the Aga Khan Museum, and Museum of Toronto. And we are also advisors to organizations such as the Metcalf Foundation and the city's own strategic plan for cultural development uh, and culture and how to build communities with the arts. Uh, in my short walk between my home at Summerland Terrace and Arts Etobicoke, one of the most striking aspects of our community is the mural work. Uh, while there's a lot of uh, exterior wall space, and this uh, project could go on for the foreseeable future, um, we also understand that with each new addition of this project, it becomes more and more difficult to attract attention of the press and the community. As a multiple, uh, multidisciplinary artist uh, working primarily in technology, I am leading Arts Etobicoke on a mission to create an augmented reality experience that will revitalize the existing murals uh, with new perspectives and viewpoints, along with uh, a companion education program to instruct our local youth on how they can have a career in the arts and technology. We have the support of our local BIA. We've initiated a campaign to raise funds to begin the project. We've even imbued our um, annual report with an augmented reality experience with an uh, iOS app to help educate the public and potential donors on how the arts and technology can affect the community. Imagine driving down Dundas to see large groups of people visiting our neighborhood, interacting with the arts of the future during a local Nuit Blanche uh, celebration. With your continued support, Arts Etobicoke can cont continue to spearhead these kinds of projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Francis, Councillor Nunziata. Yeah, thank you. Just a question, within the Etobicoke boundaries, so how many arts groups are there? You, you have Etobicoke Arts, Lakeshore Arts, Maybell. Yes. Right, that's three, is there, and which other? We have, we have a, a, a membership program, so there's, uh, and some of those groups belong with us, so the uh, Etobicoke Philharmonic is part of that. Um, there's also, um, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking, there's a, a, a an organization that uh, is urban arts part part of your urban arts is uh, actually boundary? no it's actually across uh, in uh, n east in Weston yeah 
but it's not part of the because we're Etobicoke, right? Yes, they're well, they're part of the lassos, so yeah. we communicate, but they're not actually part of it. Oh, they're not. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Sure. Thanks for your time. Just welcome uh, Councillor Crisanti from Ward One. Welcome, Vince. Next uh, speaker is Susan Wright. Welcome. Thank you very Ms. much. Um, thank you for taking the time to hear me from me uh, today, councillors. I note just how many people here are here talking about the arts, and I really encourage all city council to think of us very much as your allies as we go forward in building this city. Clearly, strong arts programming has a big impact on the community and a big impact on all of your constituents, which is why so many of them come out to um, ask that you continue to support the work that they're doing. My name's Susan Wright. I'm the Deputy Director of Toronto Arts Council, which, as most of you know, is the city's primary arts granting organization. Each year, we adjudicate over 2,000 applications and disperse $18 million in grants to over 1,000 organizations and individual artists. I would like to begin by commending City Council for your support of the arts in Toronto. We've come a very long way in the last four years and Council deserves credit for implementing a strong arts agenda. 2013 was a turning point. After more than a decade of reports, funding comparisons with other cities, vibrant city engagement from Toronto's young artists, and Council motions dating back to 2003, in 2013 City Council committed to a plan for increased investment to be rolled out between 2013 and 2017. The final $2 million for implementation of this plan is yet to be confirmed, and we encourage you to include it in the 2018 budget. The initial results from increased funding were reported on by Nordicity, and several people here have talked about that report. The findings were extremely positive. I wanna highlight just two. One, there's been a significant increase in arts programming outside the downtown core. In 2016 alone, TAC grants supported over 500 performances, exhibitions, and events throughout the inner suburbs. People living here in Etobicoke now have many more opportunities to take part in and benefit from arts events than ever before. The second finding is economic. Since 2013, arts grants provided to Toronto's most established organizations have increased by $6 million. In that same period, those organizations have raised an additional $50 million in revenues from other sources. Clearly, city funding is a major catalyst. In terms of TAC, our grants program funding of $18 million is equivalent to just $6.48 per Torontonian. But through our competitive jury process, it's achieving great impact. New funding is allowing us to introduce programs that increase accessibility and inclusion for artists and audiences throughout the city. In 2017, we were able to launch a newcomer and refugee artist program. Leah referred a little bit to that. Offering support and mentorship to exceptional artists arriving in Toronto from around the world. In 2016, 73 grants to youth-led arts projects gave over 2,500 talented young people the chance to lead and participate in arts programming outside the downtown core. And although Paulina didn't talk about that, her role in that has been instrumental as uh, the executive director of Art Reach. Many councillors were able to join us at Arts in the Parks, launched in 2016 in partnership with Toronto Parks, with additional support from the Mayor's Evening for the Arts. Over two years, Arts in the Parks has brought 593 arts performances, exhibitions, screenings, and events to parks all over the city, to the great delight of almost 200,000 Torontonians. You've uh, heard from Leah about Maybell's terrific program in Broad Acres Park. Not surprisingly, Toronto's artists and arts organizations have responded with energy and creativity to TAC's new funding programs. Ideas and applications for support have doubled in the last few years. What will Toronto gain by sustaining our commitment and investing a further two million in the arts in 2018? We will gain the opportunity to have these funds matched and matched again by significant new federal and provincial arts funding. And we will gain the benefits of in innovation and inspiration that artists bring to Toronto. By supporting our creators, designers, and artists, supporting the knowledge economy, together we are firmly establishing Toronto as a center for innovation. Our artists and creative 
thinkers create not just their own jobs, but opportunities for many others. We encourage you to meet City Council's commitment and achieve that $25 per capita arts funding by including the final $2 million in the 2018 budget. Thank you very much for your time. Question, Council Mahavik. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good to see you, Susan. Um, I'm working off this uh, list that was supplied by uh, our uh, good staff, a summary of new enhanced business cases for budget committees review and consideration. Are you, are you familiar with that document? I, I, I have seen it. I haven't got it in front of me, so. Oh, okay, um, I, I could pass this on, if we, but probably not uh, needed. Um, and where arts funding falls is under the economic development and culture. Uh, it is on that list of places where city council may, if the resources are there, uh, provide some monies. And that's where I think your $2 million that's, that's thing right. is coming, right? There is $2 yeah. million in it. The total, if you add those up, uh, if all the individual items come. That, that's where, that's where uh, I'm uh, kind of wondering. Uh, because the Toronto Arts Council piece of it is listed only as 500000 but then there's a variety of other pieces, Toronto Significant Events, which is a million, um, uh, s the public art operations and maintenance, 200000 uh, New Year's Eve, 400000 music strategy rollout, 200000 museum marketing expansion, 200000 uh, major cultural organizations, Harborfront Centre, 250, and mm -hmm. Indigenous Culture, 300. Is that so, the two million? Yes. So I think not everything, uh, and I'd have to look, but it, it mostly adds up to the two million. I think when we talk about the twenty-five dollars per capita arts funding that we have been aiming for, it's not just Toronto Arts Council. I mentioned when I was speaking that Toronto Arts Council's funding is actually just about six and a half dollars per capita, but there's a lot more to the city's arts support than just arts grants. Although many of us would contend arts grants uh, go further for your dollar than almost any other. Okay, so so your ask is not for increasing that 500 to 2 million, but to fund as much of this package as we can, which includes you, but is not restricted to you. Great. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask a, a bit of a, a topical and sensitive question. Last week there was some uh, you know startling rev revelations to come out of uh, Soul Pepper not-for-profit theater. Was was that? Funded by the Arts Council or directly by the city? I'm, I'm not oh, aware how that. It's funded by the Toronto Arts Council right. and by the other council. Right. And so what I read in the paper, one of the recent additions, that the federal government is going to be reviewing, you know, the conditions under which, you know, they hand out these grants and, you know, a little higher level of scrutiny. And I'm just wondering if, if certain measures are in place or if the Arts Council will look at putting measures in place. And I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I understand there's only so much you can do because you're not on the board, you're not there, but there are questions that can be asked. There, uh, definitely, and um, uh, human rights policies and harassment-free workplace policies, all um, um, sort of under guideline from the city, are very much a part of Toronto Arts Council's granting. And um, Soul Pepper and all uh, Toronto Arts Council's uh, grant recipients do sign those and they are effective you know as of the date as of now i think as has been identified and i don't i don't want to get too involved in this but as seems to have been identified in the press the problem with in this specific case does not seem to have been that the policies weren't there right. but how they were communicated and implemented was perhaps not at the level so i think there is a great deal of Awareness building, education, Toronto Arts Council is certainly com committed to participating in that. We have a program that we uh, called Creative Champions Network, which is an a, um, a education and professional development program for board members to try to in, um, increase sort of their understanding of their role, and, and this will definitely be a part of that education effort. Okay, good, thank you. Thanks for coming today. Okay, okay next I have Mr. David Cox. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, John. I don't know. We, we can't explain 
you know, what's happening. This is... Oh, you need that. It must have known that then. What's happening here? Where's Mary? Why did you? She's still in the 19th century era of overhead. Since the mayor's here, I'll give him a black and white copy, only of the ones I'm going to show. I will try and put it up, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, where the IT guy is on. Why is it not going up? Oh, there we go. Oh, I, well, I apologize for the, the quality. Four slides. And I'm not asking for money. But what I am asking for is a much better budgeting process for this city. Uh, I've been coming here for four years. I've talked about lack of data, poor charts. Uh, it goes on and on. I see now that the C.D. Howe Institute is evaluating how municipalities do their budgeting processes. And uh, if you can see it, we're now number 20 out of 28. And yet we think we're a world-class city, and yet we can't put a budget together in an effective and efficient way that responds to the needs of the community. This is why every time I come here, we sort of have a string of people asking for more money. And I agree, we, we need more money. But the way is, how do we find the, that money? And it's not from just increasing everything, but it's looking for efficiencies. Uh, the second slide is the lack of timely performance data. Now, if you go onto the website, There's a thing saying the reports on how Toronto is doing. So you say, gee, that's good. Well, turns out the first of these reports called Performance Measurement and Benchmarking, well, the most recent version is 2014. How can you possibly be managing for 2018 when the latest data you have is three or four years old? It's like driving across Canada and knowing what I did about 50 miles a day in the Maritimes and I'm currently in the middle of the prairies. You just can't run an organization with data that is this old. Um, the world counts on city data. All right, maybe that's got something. Well, what's the most recent data? 2013. Uh, the one at the bottom. When you click on it and want to find out more about it, oh, this was discontinued after 2012. The only report in there is one which actually feeds into the first one, but we don't make that available. And yet if you go into some of the other municipalities, you can get that report for 2016. So we, for some reason, don't seem to be willing to provide citizens of this uh, city with up-to-date performance data. And if we don't have up-to-date performance data, how do we know whether the things that are being asked for for 2018 are valid, justified, or maybe just the same old stuff? Uh, next slide. Just to wrap up the points. Good performance in the city seems to go unrewarded when it comes to budgeting. I think the, the, this year's requirement is zero, am I right, John? I think it's zero. And you go through the city operations and agencies, and 35 line items all want more money, 10 are showing decreases. Last year's budget, I think we asked for something about decreases, and virtually everybody kind of fudged it, and I think the only people who came up with compliance was the city manager's office. You know, there is, seems to be no benefit for a department manager to do what the city council and the mayor asked them to do. If they're told to freeze the budget, then freeze the budget, they should. And if they are not prepared to freeze the budget, then maybe the following year they have to get less money. I mean, there's got to be some accountability and some reward for those people uh, who do respond to the needs of what the council is asking for. And point number four, there are huge number of improvement opportunities being missed because this data is so late. I've given you a list of a whole stream of ones, but I'm just going to put up a summary sheet. And you can uh, 
go and find these uh, under that benchmarking report. But let's just give you one, one example. Apparently, less than 20% of people pay property tax with a bank deduction. Well, what, why is that? Why can we not get 85% of the people having auto their, deb their account debited with a property tax? You know, why? There's surely, if they're not going to have it done automatically, then you're going to have to have a staff at the city hall processing checks, processing cash, or whatever form of thing is it coming in. There's got to be people looking at these improvement opportunities and saying, can we do a better job? Can I just get you to wrap up there, David? Yeah. So I leave the examples with you. There's a whole bunch of performance measures there, which if they were up to date and people were shared and were told what they were, I think you'd get a much better response to the budgeting process. And I hope the mayor, I know you've got lots going on your plate, but I tell you, I don't know who owns the budgeting process, but that is the big question. Who owns the budgeting process? Because they have to be the people driving this. Okay. Okay. Uh, questions? I, I have a question. Um, so, what's an example, or can you can you cite an example of benchmarking that's done by other cities in a specific area, where the city of Toronto should be you know should be pr having you know more up to date, relevant data and, and and double checking? Well, let me tell you the reason I can see the stuff for 2016 is because. Niagara, uh, the municipality of the Niagara area, publishes it online back in, I think it was December of last year. When you go and ask our people down there, when's this going to be available? Oh, well, we've kind of working on it, and they, all we show is 2015. Mm -hmm. So we're not even showing the latest data. Uh, so that's one, John. I mean, okay. all these other cities, you know, I am sure whether it's Halifax, Montreal, Edmonton, uh, Winnipeg, why would you hide the data? If you're doing a good job, you want to get out there and show your, your taxpayers you are doing a good job. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your time today. Next, I have Leila Saranji. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thank you. My name is Layla Serengi and I work at Women's Habitat of Etobicoke. We have a 25-bed emergency shelter for women and their children who are fleeing violence, as well as a community outreach center where we provide services to about 900 diverse women and their children every year. The vast majority of the women we work with are living in deep poverty and face significant barriers to achieving security and safety. I'm here today because we're disappointed and frankly very worried about the impacts of yet another austerity budget that will compound the marginalization these women are facing that's based on their income, gender, ind indigenous status, race, ability, sexual um, expression and orientation, citizenship and family status among other socio and economic uh, locations. Council has adopted a number of really great strategies and plans and and have made promises that would make the city more inclusive. But these promises are empty when they're made without the commitment to fund and follow through on achieving their targets. And it has se severe impacts on the women who we serve. The current crisis in our shelter system, it's not a surprise, it's, but rather it's an ex expected manifestation of not funding and following through on housing plans that include the creation of a thousand new affordable rental units annually, the poverty reduction strategy, and other plans that promote economic and social equity and income security that include transit affordability, creating new recreation spaces, the funding of an Indigenous Affairs Office, the anti-black racism strategy, and accessibility for people with di disabilities, to name a few. The equity budgeting process that the city has put in place um, over the past two years starts to point in the right direction. I was happy to participate in the external review committee this year and wanted to commend the work that staff in the Poverty Reduction Office, SFDA, and EDHR have done so far. But the process is still very far away from the vision that was set out in the intersectional gender budgeting motions adopted by Council first in June 2016 and then in February 2017. These motions require the development of a framework, a set of indicators, consultations with women and women-serving organizations, and a disaggregated data strategy 
that will enable equi the equity budgeting process to be evidence-based, consistent, and applied to capital budgets and revenue tools in addition to operating budgets. This kind of informed process and decision making would give guidance to staff and council as to where to allocate resources that would help to eliminate the systemic barriers that people in our communities are facing. Um, and gender budgeting, intersectional gender budgeting, is not about narrowing a scope, but rather centering the experiences of those who are facing the greatest challenges and who are frequently left out of these processes. Um, just to highlight with a story, we had at our outreach center a woman come to us um, last Thursday, just this past Thursday, believing that we were a place, our outreach center was a place where she could come and stay. Our shelter is at an undisclosed separate location. Um, her, she came with four children. Her oldest was 12 and the youngest was two months. They'd been in the country for two nights only. They came from West Africa and they had nowhere to go. Our staff spent three hours trying to find shelter for her and when our office was closing at five, we had to put them in a taxi back to the church who had sent them to us with a promise that Central Intake was gonna call them back when they found her, sh um, when they found her beds. Um, this woman is new to the country. She has no status, no income no housing and very limited English and her story is not uncommon. The number of women who've been walking into our outreach center in this way has been increasing over the last uh, number of months and probably years if we go back that far. The recent investments into shelter spaces and respite centers will not help her or her family and they're not appropriate for her anyway. And in fact, in South Etobicoke, we don't have a respite center and we don't have an out of the cold program for women. There's only a men's one and women are asked to leave when they show up there. This budget, which is dangerously balanced on draws from reserves, an inflated housing market, and an inflationary pro property tax increase, is not sustainable and doesn't address the root causes of systemic poverty and discrimination. We want the city to choose a budget that leverages a range of revenue tools, invests significantly in areas of housing, transit, childcare, recreation, and poverty reduction, and for these decisions to be made through a true intersectional gender budgeting process. And we look forward to our continued work on this with the city. Thank you. Councilor Mahavik. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very helpful. Um, I'm wondering, uh, are you a part of the provincial VAW system? Is that, or are you part of the city uh, shelter system? The sh our shelter is provincially funded. So we are from the provincial VAW, the Violence Against Women's Shelter System. Right, okay, so um, that's a separate system from the mm -hmm. city system. And so, uh, and you're full to capacity like always, is that what I'm hearing? We are full to capacity like always. And, and women stay with us longer and longer because we can't move them out. We can't get them into social housing or affordable rental units. So where it used to be um, six weeks to three months, women would stay with us. They're now staying with us um, 10 months, 12 months, 14. We had a woman and her two children stay with us for 22 months um, because she couldn't find any housing uh, in the city or outside of the city. So women are staying with us for a long period of time, which means we're turning our shelter. So I was, that example was at our outreach center, but our shelter turns away about 650 women and their dependents who are calling us every year because we have no space. They call us and we have to say no and try and find them somewhere else. And those folks are then sent to the city's shelter system. Do you send them to Peter Street? Is that where... We will the send them anywhere we can find that safe. So our first, if they are women who are fleeing violence, then our first um, strategy is to call the other VAW Violence Against Women Shelter Systems, who are also shelters which are also full like we are. We then call Central Intake and try to get them into um, a family shelter. Uh, those the city's are central a ci yeah the city's Central Intake line. We try and get them into a city-funded homeless shelter. That is proving to be more and more difficult. It used to not be so full, but now we can't even do that. So now we call places like Halton, Brampton, Peel, uh, Hamilton. If women can travel, we will help to send them out there. But then that means they're being uprooted from their communities, their friends, their social circles, maybe childcare, maybe their jobs. Uh, transit is harder to find. Um, we get calls from Halton and other places trying to get women who've moved out back into the city quite frequently. Just a, a little bit more, Mr. Chair. Um, so, um, 
You, would you agree that uh, we need to be, uh, as, as an advocacy piece, recognizing that yes, the city has to up its game in the shelter housing and support area, no dispute there, but we also have to encourage, inspire, uh, provoke the province to also increase its better its game in the piece around violence against women shelters. Well, absolutely. I, the, we've been flatlined for a very long time by the province, but the province does um, have gender budgeting as well, and they are they've put out a statement, um, and so they have a mandate. Uh, the city doesn't have a gender strategy. We have a gender budgeting process that kind of fell flat for the last two years, and so yeah, we need to be an advocate, but we can also show. Um, leadership and and our experiences are compounded by the lack of shelter services and housing and actually I think housing is the the key piece okay so that was going to be my next question mm -hmm. so there are getting fit people from the cold into a respite center getting folks from a respite center into a regular bed there's people then there's the need to develop some transitional housing some supportive housing um, yes. and affordable housing if you were to say recognizing that you know, you got to bite off something somewhere first. What would your advice be to us as a city? Where you think the biggest, the lowest hanging, the lowest ball that we need to kind of uh, raise our raise our work on? What, what would you say that would be? The biggest bang for the buck. I think the two pieces are the emergency shelter crisis that we found ourselves in now. Um, that we need to get people off the streets and out of unsafe situations, um, but we need to be uh, developing affordable housing. Uh, that has to happen at the same time. You can't do one without the other. That's awful. Thank you very much. Okay. Just give a couple of questions. So how many, how many spaces do you have at Women's Habitat? 25 beds. 25. That, that's for women and children. For women and children. 25 beds. So if a woman comes in, she's got three kids. Mm -hmm. That's four beds. That's four beds. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you can only have so many families. You don't, I mean, it just it, it varies, right? That's correct. And how much funding do you get from the City of Toronto? We don't get funding from the City okay. of Toronto. You don't get any, so no. where, where do you get your funding from? We get our funding from the Ministry of Community Social Services and the United Way of okay. Toronto and New York Region, and then we uh, have a lot of private donors. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. How much, how much of your budget is privately raised? Um... I don't know offhand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And how many staff do you have for this in this facility? Do, do you have an administrative place? I got the feeling you've got two locations. We you have two one? locations. So uh, we have about 10, 8 to 10 full-time staff at uh, the shelter, okay. uh, about 10 in our outreach center, and um, another 10 in admin, 8 to 10 in admin. So you've got 30 staff? We have about 33 staff in total, including uh, managers. Okay. Okay, thanks for your time. Okay. Okay, next I have uh, John Keating, Coalition of Business Improvement Areas and Residents Associations. Hello, thanks very much for uh, allowing me to uh, make a presentation today. My name is John Keating. Um, I am the chairman of the Regal Heights Residents Association, which is in the Dufferin and St. Clair West area. Uh, and I'm here to urge you to support funding for a two-hour transfer for the TTC. Um, as you know, the, bo the TTC board has already approved it to come in uh, hopefully in August of this year, uh, provided it can get funding from the city. Uh, and I'm sure you're probably all familiar with it, but a time-based fare means a person can get on and off the TTC as many times as they want within a, win a certain window of time, typically two hours. Uh, and I'm also uh, here representing a coalition called Two Hour Fair 4TO. Uh, we represent several residence associations, uh, business improvement areas across the city, as well as transit advocates, including the group TTC Riders. And I'm in a unique position to speak to this issue because the area I live in, uh, St. Clair, uh, uh, St. Clair West, had a two hour transfer for about seven years until the service, until that uh, perk was discontinued last September. And I can tell you firsthand that it really makes a difference to people's decisions on whether or not to take transit. Uh, as a rider, I could take care of routine errands on the way home, stopping for something to eat, uh, picking up uh, some groceries. If I, had, if I still had little kids, I could pick them up from daycare. Uh, and I know, I, I know from firsthand experience that it's m much more likely when you have a two-hour fare or a time-based fare 
that you can uh, that you're going to uh, help out uh, excuse me that you're going to stop at local businesses on the way uh, otherwise uh, you're more likely to just do everything all the little chores and routines you're going to get in the car go to the big box store uh, with a with a, a two-hour fare uh, you're more likely to shop locally because you can get on and off that that street car or that bus uh, and uh, that makes for a healthier business local business community when you have a healthy local business community I believe you have a stronger community generally uh, two-hour fares align well with Toronto's climate action plan uh, the increased flexibility they provide makes transit much more of a, an attractive alternative to the car uh, and when we get people out of their cars and on transit it helps relieve gridlock and it helps reduce greenhouse gases two-hour fares are also good for people on low income uh, th there are a number of people in my area who don't have cars uh, they're on fixed incomes because they're retired um, and it makes things much easier for them. They can get around and do the things they have to do without having to pay an extra fare every time. But there's one more reason that I think uh, transit riders deserve the convenience and cost saving of a two-hour fare. For a long time now, we've been paying the highest proportion of operating costs of any transit city in North America. It's time, I think it's time we got more for our money. It's time we had the same option that car drivers do to stop along our route and take care of little errands. It's time for time-based transfers. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Councillor Nunziata. Well, actually, you have three members on the commission that are here today, right? That's right. Yeah. Three members. Uh -huh. um, has Tabby endorsed it? Yes, Tabby is part of our of our uh, organization of our. Yeah. So they've sent a letter of endorsement because I haven't seen them. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so John, um, John Carew. Carew has been heavily involved, and I'm surprised that you haven't seen one because I, I know haven't. I know all uh, we various members of the, uh, the various individual BIAs and John Carew and TTC Riders and myself and some other residents associations have all sent letters supporting this. And your BIA is in St. Clair and which area? Uh, St. Uh, Clair from uh, Winona to Dufferin. I'm not actually BIA, I'm Residents Association, but the, the BIA, is the, it's called the Regal Heights BIA. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. yeah Regal Heights. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So why are you so passionate about it as a Residents Association person? Uh, because a lot of people in my neighborhood uh, use the TTC heavily. I, I myself, I, I haven't owned a car in seven years. That's, I get around on TTC as, as well as bicycle, and I'm, I'm not the only one. Um, and uh, it, really, um, it really makes it much more inconvenient. I mean, you've you got to think twice. I mean, I, I guess it's only $3, but if, if you've got to, if you've got to sort of think twice about, well, I, I'd like to get off and buy a croissant at, at my local bakery, but do I really want to spend the extra money, you know, on the way home? It, it's, uh, the other thing is, too, that you have to keep in mind that Toronto is the only transit system in the GTA that, that doesn't have this. We're, we're the odd man out here. Um, and uh, I, th I think, you know, is, if it's possible to do it in other jurisdictions in this area, we should be able to do it as well. So you're seeing personal positive benefits? And I, I guess also economic benefits to retail streets. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that sums it up very well. Yeah, personal positive benefits. It makes it much more flexible for me and for and for my neighbors uh, to get to get around. And and as I said, uh, uh, I think uh, you, there's. I'm I'm not with the BIA, but I have heard anecdotal evidence from from members of the BIA that they saw a drop in local business uh, once once the the two hour transfer was discontinued in September. So I have a question. So that little, I think you referred to it as a perk uh, that went away. That little perk is going to cost the TTC about 20 to $25 million. It's very open-ended. How many residents associations do you represent? Uh, I'm personally representing my own, but, but I have sent, I've sent out uh, letters to uh, something like 80 asking for their support. I got responses from about 20 or so. So do you think that people would be prepared to increase their property taxes by an extra half percent to pay for that? I think so. I mean, on a, on a broader issue, I, I personally would like to see taxes increased for, uh, for a number of things. I mean, this is a city that, that's constantly trying to uh, 
you know, uh, make, make ends meet by, by cutting little things, by kicking the problem down the road. I, I think it's time that if we want to have the city, we want, if we want a city that we, we all agree we, we want, that, that we want to have a, a, a future where things are funded properly. We're not always, you know, picking quarters out of our pockets to try and figure out how we're going to pay for something out, down the road. I think it's time to say, yeah, if we're going to have this city, we've got to pay for it. The way you pay for it is, is increased uh, taxes. Okay. All right. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Next, I have up Ruth Shembri. Shembri. Sorry, I could have just said Ruth. Maybe you <laughs> Ruth you, you, you would have known. Okay. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, on a very broad level, I just it, this may or may not be helpful. Would like to um, just give you my opinion. I've I've spent. 30 years working in community mental health. So that basically means I've been involved with a lot of people who are either homeless or pretty darn close. And I keep reminding people in their 30s and 40s that we did not have this problem in the late 70s and early 80s. And not everybody knows this. I mean, sure, we had Seton House, and there were people who had problems with their alcohol consumption or whatever. We were not tripping over people uh, sitting in, in doorways and, uh, and there weren't the same number of people asking for money. I remember being told, put a dollar in your pocket and give it to anyone who asks you. Well, that was in the early 60s and you could find maybe one person looking for, uh, it'd, it'd be finished. I would have no money if I gave money to everyone who asked me. So I worked in, uh, in at Sistering, it was, it's a women's drop-in center in the early 80s, and we were supporting isolated women in deep poverty. About 20 years later, I was invited back as one of the founding staff people, and I, they gave me a little award, which was very nice, and the, I looked at the mission statement, which now included homeless women. And I wrote to, um, I realize I'm now speaking provincially, I wrote to uh, Premier McGinty at the time, and I told him this. I said, I've been doing this for 20 years, and it's only getting worse. And, the, and from my perspective now, it continues to get worse. And what we really need, and everybody knows this, is uh, affordable housing. And the city really needs to do something about getting money from the other levels of government. I'm part of a, a large network with access to about, about 4,000 voters. And I'm not saying I represent them, but um, myself and my colleagues have access to them, we'd be happy to lobby. If somebody would just give us some ideas about who to lobby, what to ask for, we'd be happy to lobby the province and the federation. And speaking, uh, picking up on what uh, the last person who presented said, yes, go ahead and raise some taxes. Good grief. It's, it's, it's shameful what's going on now. I work in and out of the cold and you know, help people, you know, get onto little mattresses on the floor of my church. Thank you very much. <coughs> Councilor Mahavik. Thank you. Uh, given your broad experience uh, in the, uh, in shelters and out of the cold and that, um, and noting that, yes, something has happened in the last 20, 20 years. Uh, what's your wisdom there? What happened? And it's not going to be overnight to fix it. Oh no, of course not. Um, but what happened? Like so we, well, so I, we're noticing that was the Fed stop building, uh, giving us money for affordable housing, and we don't just need affordable; we need supportive, definitely supportive. I, I was working in one program. This fellow had come straight from Queen Street Mental Health Center, then called that, and he was putting his boots in a stove to warm them up, and then he would go off somewhere and, and leave them. So that person, we were at that point providing sort of once a day, that person needed 24 hour support or he was going to burn this whole uh, apartment building down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the problem was lack of federal funding. They've, they've announced they're back in the game. They're not giving us money for a few more years or they're not putting their money in for a few that's more right. years. Uh, but that's the, and we should be investing that when we get it in support of housing more than anything Affordable else. Affordable and supportive housing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your So question. you wanted to know who to lobby? There's a, there's well, a, there's a. Well, we know who to lobby. It's, it's. There's a provincial election coming. It's either yes. going to be in May or June, you know, just hammer those guys. Well, I like to go.
experts and you say, you know, what, say what is the most specific helpful thing that we could ask for that we might actually get? That, Money. Yeah. No. Right. <laughs> Simple. Thank you. With no ties attached. <laughs> All you have to do is ask for money. I have a question. I have a question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ruth, Ruth. Yeah. Ruth um, so, you know, we we hear it all the time from deputants come forward and suggest we increase property tax because they feel that if we increase it, we can provide all the services. Now, if we, if we were to um, increase property tax and give uh, all the money that's been requested, uh, you are aware that we're going into double-digit increases. And as well, there are people out there that do not support uh, property tax many. increase. Many. Many, like the majority yep. of Torontonians. And even before you send out a tax bill, they'll call you and complain that you've increased your taxes. So it's fine to say that, but when you're ta if we give everything that's been asked, it would be double-digit increases. And a lot of people would be on the streets because they won't be they wouldn't be able to pay their property tax or pay their rent. Well, which is why I mentioned the yeah. other two orders so. of government. Thank you. Okay, next we have a supplemental list of an additional five names. I have Debbie Hall. Hi there, Debbie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. We've got five minutes. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Um, this is going to be short and sweet. Okay. <laughs> we like sweet. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Councilman. My name is Deborah Hall. I've lived in Ward 6 for about 21 years. And I want to address a need for shelters and affordable housing for people. People are losing their homes because they can't afford the rent. And when, when they do pay their rent, they can't afford food. So it's a win and lose situation for them. The shelter should remain open past April so somebody will have a chance to find a home or something to live in instead of staying in a shelter all their life, right? It's not, there's not enough beds in shelters for anybody. Okay, I know people in Etobicoke who are sleeping in parks and staying at friends, and this is very unstable for the children and the adults, and they have no dignity left when they're finished. Okay, would you please consider funding more shelter spaces and affordable housing for the people that need it, because this need is growing worse every day. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for your time. Okay. Next I have Helen Marquis, or Marcus. Good afternoon. It's going to be short and sweet. But That's all right. Good afternoon, Budget Committee in Toronto. Councillors, my name is Helen Marquis, or Marquis, if you want to pronounce it in French. Um, I live at 28 Ash Crescent. It's a basement apartment in a house with its own entrance. I want to share my story with you. I have lived here for three years. On November 13th, 2017, my landlord approached me to sign an agreement to end the tenancy as of September 30th, 2018. I checked with someone else and was advised not to sign it. When I let my landlord know I wasn't going to sign it, she was not pleased. I was told, do you want to do this the hard way or the easy way? I can give you an eviction notice and start renovating in March. I again consulted with someone and was told September 2018 gives me time to find a place, whereas March 2018 will not. I was between a rock and a hard place. I felt pressured, so I signed the agreement to end the tenancy. This is just my story, and one of many. I have a question. When is affordable housing going to become new, to become available, new affordable housing? Okay, off here, sorry. So many more of our citizens are becoming seniors. Food bank usage alone has increased by 27% over the last year and is increasing fast. I'm one of that percentage. Where did the other one go? 
Oh, on this side. Sorry. I turned 65 last Saturday. And how many seniors before that and after that will be in the same turmoil as me? In 2010, I had to move from my neighborhood of 29 years to another area I was unfamiliar with. Again, in 2015, when I had my heart attack, I had to move again. And that brings me full circle to having to move next year. That's, okay, the last, was this? Okay, when are seniors not to have to worry about getting an ultimatum to end tenancy or face eviction? I know I could have done something, but it's easier. Just to, uh, so why is why the your, your the place you're living right now the landlord is evicting you? Is that what? No, but she wants to make a dance studio. Oh, dance studio. Downstairs, which is where I live, and she wanted me to do it the easy way by signing an end of tenancy agreement. Mm. I didn't want to because I thought this was my last move. I, I mean, I'm 65, I don't want to move anymore. And uh, when I did say I wasn't going to sign it, that's what she did. She gave me an ultimatum. Well, we can do it easy way or hard way. I can give you a notice and, and have to start renovating in March. So in other words, she gave me really no choice except to sign the agreement to leave at the end of September did you next have a year. Lease? Do you have a lease? We did, but it ended in June. Oh, so it ended. It ended in June. Actually, June, two years ago. Oh, okay, so you're month to month. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize this was gonna make a difference because it wasn't like that when I first moved in. But there's a lot of more seniors that are worse sure. than I am, okay. definitely. Thanks for your time today. And they today. need the help. And good luck. New affordable housing. Mm. Next we have Jasmine Dosh, D-O-C-H, Dosh, Doc. Jasmine, I know I have that right. Oh, there's two Jasmines. Oh, okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm actually here as a South Etobicoke resident, and um, I've been living in there, the Etobicoke Lakeshore area, for about 35 years. And I also work for LAMP, but I'm not um, speaking on behalf of LAMP today. I'm speaking of um, as a resident and as somebody in the community who has some wonderful people that are here today with us um, that came with us and shared with me some of their um, concerns. The first thing that I'd like you to say, and by the way, thank you very much for letting me speak today. Um, one of my biggest concerns is the affordable housing issue in Toronto. Uh, that goes for shelters, that goes for affordable housing. One of the things I'd really like to uh, challenge the council and the budget committee to do um, is look at how the city, city building departments, permit departments, city's affordable housing office, can be very, very innovative in helping people to perhaps make more housing in their homes. I'll just give you an example. I have a house and I'm ready to do something with it, whether I sell it or whether I do something with it. Um, and I'm almost a senior, so I'm looking to maybe have some rental units in my house, possibly, so I can retire and enjoy the wonderful recreation services and pools and things in Etobicoke. But I think I'm not the only person in that, um, in that predicament, and I think that there might be some opportunities for the city to do some creative maybe permits or something so that it can give people incentive to build more housing or some rental units for people who need it. I'd like to help some of my uh, fellow residents in South Etobicoke and you know it's something that I don't really want to make a la money as a landlord but it's something that I think that we need to look uh, to help more of our local residents. Um, so I think that that's an opportunity. I also think that, um, you know, I'm looking at my neighbor next door who's built this huge, huge house, and, and it's, it's like big, 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 big. And um, I think that maybe we could be a little bit more creative with our, our bylaws and have some incentives for maybe multi-units so that people could um, have more people living in there. 
Um, I also know that from speaking to a lot of people in the Etobicoke Lakeshore area, that many seniors have been forced to leave the community. So um, I'm a little worried about that, and I'm concerned. I was talking, I was in our drop-in, the LAMP adult drop-in program today, and I was talking to a few of the people who are attending the ad adult drop-in, um, and they were saying that they are on fixed incomes, and they are having a great deal of trouble to get a landlord to rent to them because they are on a fixed income. And I think uh, the city departments have been looking into that. People on fixed incomes are having real trouble finding affordable housing, and that's particularly acute in South Etobicoke. The other issue that I just want to mention that um, I feel very strongly about is childcare spaces. I know that the uh, Social Planning Council put out some information recently that said that the, if the city put in two million, that um, other government funding could secure a thousand childcare spaces. Um, I walked down to the earlier center earlier today and I heard from parents that childcare is a really big issue. So affordable housing, shelter beds, permanent shelter beds, and um, more childcare, and recreation. Also, that was also brought to my attention from the Social Planning Council. 198 spaces uh, for recreation programs, that's the waiting list, that's incredible. 198,000 people have applied for a recreation program and couldn't get it. So these are the things that I, I care about, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, thanks for your time. Any questions? No questions. Thank you. Next, I have John Sprague. Thank you. I'll talk fast. Housing in three numbers. The city housing wait list in 2016, 80,000. That was the most recent figure I could get. New units planned by 2020, according to the city's own budget documents, 10,000. Homeless deaths in 2017, 70. That's the deaths we know about and can attribute directly to homelessness. It doesn't include people who are marginalized on the streets and are thought to have died of other things, such as drug, drug overdoses. I'm not going to bore you with uh, making too many appeals to decency, but I will say there are a number of practical steps, which are not solutions, that you might consider. The following, micro-housing, cooperative residences, basically cooperative rooming houses. As a solution, it does work. It's not perfect, but it does work. It keeps people sheltered. House sharing, i.e. granny flats. Several people have mentioned this. I will mention it too. I will al also supportive housing for people with mental health issues. The three things you need to do to make that happen, and two of them are budget issues, are information, support, and standards enforcement. Because otherwise, some micro-housing will amount to some profiteer uh, dividing up a cellar into 10 cubicles and making a mint, which people do now already. And we find out about it when there's a fire and a tragedy. Um, secure housing support. Simply make it a policy not to cut off housing support funds until staff has definitively established that the person is not eligible for them. I've heard and seen plenty of cases where somebody miss misses one meeting, possibly is directed to, the, uh, to an office which has been changed because city changes support, income support how offices fairly frequently on people. <clears throat> the, the, the line will be, oh, you're, you're going to Etobicoke. No, 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 you're going to the office on, um, on north of, um, north of uh, Mount Dennis. No, no, you, no, you're going someplace else. And then if the person doesn't meet the... Uh, meet the uh, appointment well, they don't need housing support, so they're cut off. When that happens, for somebody with a support system in place, friends, family, willing to take care of them, it's a nuisance. When it happens to somebody without those things, it's a catastrophe. They end up on the street. And, I mean, anyone who thinks that the city is spending money by that kind of misbehavior is, uh, needs, needs a reality check. We just end up spending more on emergency housing. 
Um, finally, I will make my last appeal. This is a matter of decency. This is an extremely wealthy city, an extraordinarily wealthy city. I would say in some, in some respects a parasitically wealthy city because a lot of our wealth comes from the extraction of resources that justly belong to First Nations people. But in any case, we have a lot of money. Having people die on the streets in 2017 is categorically unacceptable. And having people needlessly suffer on the streets is categorically unacceptable. That's all I got for you today. Questions? Thank you very nope. much. Thanks for your time. Next, I have uh, Debbie Bridge. Debbie Bridge? No. Yasmin Hak Khan? Good afternoon. Thank you, counselors. Now the final, the, the correct Yasmin. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Jasmine Hakan. I work for the Social Planning Toronto, mostly in Etobicoke now. On December the 13th, we had a community forum on the budget, uh, on the city budget, which was attended by over 50 people on a very bitterly cold night. I am sharing some of the comments, some of the issues, some of the topics that were raised at that meeting by many of the residents uh, at that meeting. Many times, the ones that I am, they covered a very broad range from childcare, transit, health, housing, youth, seniors, employment, poverty, community building. But the ones I'm going to touch on were the ones which were mentioned uh, several times, or more than one time. Uh, the, one, the whole issue around housing, this is on December 13th, before the current housing emergency crisis, afforded affordable housing, um, supportive housing, Ontario housing, community housing in decent shape, needs for special housing was talked over and over again. I, I know Councillor um, Presenti was able to attend for part of the meeting, but he's not here today. Anyway, uh, the other issues which were mentioned were related to health and dementia and mental health and supportive housing for people with uh, health issues. Uh, for especially mental health. In the central Etobicoke, North Etobicoke, we have held, uh, we have been dealing with youth violence. That came up a number of times also. I did not hear today, but that was, it is an issue, a major issue, especially around the Kingsview Westway area. Youth employment, you, jobs for youth, that also came up a number of times. How do we provide recreation? How do we provide safe spaces? How do we keep our young people out of gangs and violence and all? Um, the other issues which were, of course, the lack of income, the poverty, I think many of our speakers have already touched upon them. Childcare, public transit, that's an ongoing issue. As Social Planning Toronto, we have mentioned and spoken around a number of issues. I today only wanted to touch on what we heard directly from our residents in Etobicoke. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No questions? Okay. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Okay. So that, that concludes my list. Is there any anyone else who would like to um, come and say a few words? No? Okay. So we have a motion. doesn't matter who. It doesn't matter who reads it. That the Budget Committee for Etobicoke East York and York Centre consultation, receive for information, the public presentations, and the communications submitted by members of the public. All in favor? Okay, that's received. And then we are now going to recess and come back again at 6 o'clock to hear people who can only make the evening session. So thank you all for coming today. Appreciate your participation and your words and, uh, and commentary. Thank you.